faith arise. Let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like Okay, friends, make your way back to your seat for announcements time. Okay, come on back. Sit on down. Okay, great. Good morning, church. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, what an honor it is to uh, be with you and share with you briefly about uh, what occurred last night. Last night was the 2024 Boots and Barbecue. Uh, it was uh, wildly successful. Uh, we had uh, a wonderful attendance uh, with the event, uh, which is just proof positive of uh, God's power and providence because uh, just less than 10 days ago, we were a little discouraged. Uh, we, the, the attendance didn't look like the numbers were, uh, were gonna be that significant, but uh, in an amazing show of uh, his mercy and grace, uh, the Lord did provide the attendance. It was uh, phenomenal. It was a powerful evening. We had a really, really great time. Uh, some other really great news from that is that uh, through the uh, generosity of everyone that was there, uh, certainly through the generosity of all of you, the uh, church family of Northern Hills, uh, we were able to draw in almost $30,000, uh, which is just phenomenal. Uh, so uh, thank you all for that. Uh, thank the, the folks that uh, were in attendance. Certainly there were people uh, engaging uh, virtually that weren't actually physically uh, at the event, but were engaging through the uh, online portal. That was pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, just just a word to say, uh, man, thank you, church. Uh, it's it's just wonderful to know that uh, the this uh, particular ministry is uh, so well supported by all of you, and and we thank you for all of your support. I know on behalf of the school board, the uh, the children, the families, the teacher, the st- the teachers, the staff, everyone just truly, truly appreciate all of your support, uh, all of your giving, all of your generosity, all of your love and your prayers. So thank you all so very, very much for all that you do. Uh, we appreciate you. Praise God. Thanks, Jerry. I kind of sprung that on him last minute because you know, coming off of the thing last night, and I was like, hey, just tell everybody how great it was. It was super fun. If you didn't go this year, think about it next year. Because it is super, it's a it's a it's just a fun event to attend with your church family and friends. And um, we played some music. It was really funny. Mike Jensen is really creative because they were like, hey, can your band play? And I'm like, I don't have a band. <laughs> I don't have a band. That was a long time ago. That was pre-kids. And uh, so the band, Mike, was real creative in coming up with a name. He's like, well, we're basically like, Amy and the Availables. <laughs> like, your friends that are available. I'm like, well, and then my husband was like, and the forced one. The one who was forced to do it, which is my husband, so. But it was a really good time, so you should come next year if you didn't go. And, um, good time of worship um, and fellowship. Uh, a few n- announcements for the week. Here's what's happening at church this week. Friday, we have youth, uh, the youth pizza and game night. That's from 7 to 10 in the FOC. That's this Friday. Saturday, we have Mabel Bailey's 90 and a quarter at the birthday celebration. Ooh. Sorry, Mabel. I'm not going to be able to attend, but I love you. And if you don't know Mabel, she's really sweet. So you should say hi. Next time we have greeting time, you just go in and tell, introduce yourself. I said 90 and three quarters first service. And I was like, no, actually take that back. Only 90 and a quarter. Um, and then, sat- so that's Saturday, one o'clock in the FOC. And then Sunday is the business meeting at 630. Woo-hoo. So much fun that he had this week, right? Come on. All right, at this time, that's all I have right now. Oh wait, no, lastly, school board. There are several openings on the school board. If you are interested, I'm going to suggest you pray about that, if that is where where you should be serving. Um, Several, like I said, there's several openings there, so pray about um, whether God's calling you to to serve in that capacity or not. It is the ministry of our church, so get involved. Find out what's going on. See what's happening at the school um, and be involved in that capacity. And if you are um, interested in serving on that school board, contact Jerry. There's some contact information um, his email and phone number are available on the slide, maybe in the bulletin, yeah. and in the bulletin. All right, enough about that. Let's get on. I'm excited. I have this video I wanted to show you guys. We couldn't make it work, but I'm really excited about worship today. It's going to be great. Like, somebody in first service was like, you just talked so fast, I could just really tell you were excited. I'm like, I am, I am. It's, sometimes you come in those Sundays and you're like, man, I'm excited to be here. The other days you're like, I'm kind of tired, but I'm here. Anyway, ready to go. Ushers, if you would come forward at this time. And our praying deacon, please. Hello. (laughs) I don't care how excited I get. I don't ever talk that fast. (laughs) y'all pray with me please dear heavenly father i thank you for the fundraiser for the school um we love the school lord i pray for uh the board members uh that some new church members would step up for that board lord and continue to push forward with that school lord Uh, thank you for the church here i pray for the message this morning lord that someone would be saved i pray for the offering that we'd use it for your kingdom lord the way you'd have us use it Um, I pray for the widows and the widowers, Lord, and pray for my wife. She's out of town. I'm alone, so (laughs) Um, I just thank you all for being here, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
you're ready to continue to worship, go ahead and stand up or sit down. It doesn't really matter if you sit or stand. Guess what? We're going to praise him anywhere. <laughs> uh, see that? Get it? Anywhere, anyhow, any way you want. All right? On the mountain, in the valley. I got real jazzed up for that song. Can't help it. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
the Lord. You can be seated this time. And our children's church will be dismissed out that door. But Jerry will bring the message today. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> have, you, uh, have, have you ever been in one of those spots where you're, you're just trying to think? It's right on the tip of your tongue. You know there's a word for that, <clears throat> and it's just not quite coming out. And then all of a sudden, you go, oh, and you think of what the word is. <clears throat> now, here's a word that, uh, well, it's only got two letters and it's not an acronym, but it's actually an entire sentence. And I heard this word spoken when I was a, when I was a kid, more often than I care to count. And I didn't, I didn't know for decades that it was actually a whole sentence. Now, I'm gonna see if any of you have heard this word. Have you heard this word spoken to you or have you spoken this word? Now who who, uh, who who wants to give a shot at uh, how you say this word? Just go ahead out loud. <laughs> All right, now I said it was not an acronym, okay? <laughs> All right, yeah. Now this this is the way that I heard this word. What? Here's the whole sentence that I learned years later that this was. You ought not to be doing that. <clears throat> and I is uh, O-U-G-H-T, of course. <clears throat> All right. And for those of you who hadn't figured it out yet, here's the translation. Whatever it is that you are doing, stop immediately. And when you hear, I... <clears throat> You best turn to the direction from which the ought came from and not only stop immediately, but pay heed to what comes next. And that way that might save you at least some degree of whatever's coming your direction because you were doing something that you shouldn't have been doing or that was displeasing to uh, mom or dad or mama or papa or somebody like <clears throat> that was in charge of you. Well, <clears throat> when it uh, <clears throat> comes to such things and when it comes to the words that come out of our mouth, there is something <clears throat> that I want to pray as we dive into this message and it's, oh Lord, I am unworthy to stand before my brothers and sisters here gathered. Let no word that comes out of my mouth be of me, but only of thee. As there's a principle that we're going to work on here that is enumerated in James chapter 1. Now, if you want to find that spot in your Bible, that's fine. But there's another spot. We're going to go by way of Proverbs 9 as well. But the, uh, I'm going to project those verses. The place that you really need to have spotted in your Bible is Acts chapter 15. You can find all those others if you want. But I'm not, I'm not projecting Acts chapter 15 up there. Way, way too many words. So find that spot here before we get into the body of the message. Acts chapter 15. All righty. Looks like we are there or close enough. Now, first of all, we're going to deal with a principle that is espoused in James 1, 19 to 20. And it says this in the NIV. I, I like the way that the NIV 
translates this passage better than I like the ESV. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You know, the Lord has a way of knowing what human nature is like. Have you noticed that? And he has a way of giving us instructions to help us work on that human nature. Usually what we're doing is the opposite of what's highlighted here. Instead of being quick to listen, we're slow to listen. Instead of being slow to speak, we're quick to speak. And instead of being slow to become angry, when we're spouting off, we're showing that we've become quick to be angry. Now, here's a little easy hint about what's going on. If you ever feel like (coughs) speaking up instantly in a situation it's probably not coming from the right source and there's probably some anger involved in this. Now, notice it doesn't say that you can't become angry. It's saying slow to become angry. But if, you're, if we're quick to speak and quick to anger, Usually what that means is we haven't done enough listening. And we're shooting our mouth off without complete information. Now, I don't know that we're ever going to have 100% total complete information. The only person that's got that one, as far as I know, is the living God himself. He knows all. He is everywhere, and he's the one that sees what was, what is, and what is to be. However, if we work against our human nature and follow this principle to be quick to listen, he is going to make sure that you and I are provided with the information that we need in order Now, when it comes to the point where it's time to speak, we will do so without having spoken out of turn, out of anger. You can fill in the blanks for uh, the way that your mind processes that. And the point is, when we speak, Having listened, considered, then what comes helps build the righteous life that God desires. Now, remember I said it doesn't say that you can't become angry. But what's a righteous anger? not going to get real deep into the weeds on this, but there is a principle here that is espoused throughout the scripture. And basically it amounts to this. If someone is advocating or doing something that is in, uh, that is contradicting to what is clearly taught in the scripture, That's something to become angry about. We have a really good example of that. When Jesus goes into the temple, he upsets the tables of the money changers and there's a flurry of sheep and doves and turtle of pigeons and he's just running them all out of the place because you have taken 
what's supposed to be a house of prayer dedicated to the living God, focused on him, and you've made it a den of robbers. What you're doing in here is not for God, it's for yourself. Now that's the time to be angry. For what is being done is antithetical, it is heretical to who and what the living God is and who and what he wants us to be. But you don't get there fast. You make sure first that we've been quick to listen. We've held our tongues to be slow to speak. And then having been through that, then if we see a problem there with more complete information, okay, maybe then it's time to speak up and maybe have the temperature turned up at least to simmer in our spirits, not being happy with what is going on. Now, that's the general principle. There is some guidance given to us depending on what we see happen. And that guidance comes up in Proverbs chapter 9 as a real succinct text for this. And there are two cases that are dealt with in these verses 7 through 9. First is the case of the scoffer, or some of your translations will say the mocker. And here's what it tells us in verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer. Don't waste your time when you see someone doing something to, to look at him and say, ah! it's not going to turn out well. And the specific advice here is do not reprove a scoffer. We do want to win people of, uh, let's say, alternative viewpoints than that which you find in the Bible. We do want to win them over toward looking at the word, considering the word, listening to good teaching, and coming into conformity with what the Bible says. But reproving a mocker is not the path. He'll just hate you. And the word hate in the Bible, when you see the word hate in the Bible, think first of all, not I'm getting angry and all steamed up and I'm going to pound my feet and I'm going to run around with my hair on fire yelling and screaming. No, what it means is I'm going to reject that choice and I'm going to make a better choice. I'm going to supplant that which is less important with that which is more important. That's the meaning of hate. When Jesus says, you need to hate your father and mother and your brother and sister and your wife and your children and all that in place of me. It's, no, I need to be first. Now, these other people can come along, but the priority is the living God. And in all of these things, this is what we're aiming for. Because we want to do things that bring about the righteous life that God desires. We want to store up treasure in heaven. We want to have an effective witness and bring other people along into the wisdom and counsel of the Lord and into his eternal saving grace. And we don't do that by getting mad at them, yelling at them, and trying to fix someone or something that's not ready to be fixed, at least not quite yet. Do not reprove a scoffer. How do you tell if someone's a scoffer? Well, the anger would be one of them. If they're spouting off, they're shooting off their mouth without complete information, speaking out of turn, if they're abusive in their speech, 
Some of them aren't abusive in their speech. They use nice vocabulary, but you know what I mean. That's a person, if I detect someone like that, if I'm in a, in a, in a circumstance where I'm pretty sure I got a scoffer in front of me, I will give a deflecting answer and move on. I won't talk to you, at least not in any meaningful way, because I'm following this advice right here. Do not reprove a scoffer. In the case of the wise, that's the rest of verse 8 and verse 9. It says to do the opposite of what you do with a scoffer. Reprove a wise man and he will reject you. No, he will love you. Go, oh, you know, give instruction to a wise man and he will be <clears throat> wiser still. <clears throat> Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. Oh, what a joy it is. All the memories I have of those who were counted amongst the wise to have the opportunity to teach. Being wise does not mean that you have a big pile of knowledge. I know a bunch of stuff. That's being educated. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're wise. The wise may be ignorant about a lot of things, not knowing what's going on. Ignorance is, I just don't know. But they want to know, they want to learn. They ask questions. If you are a wise person, my reaction to you is ask all the questions you want. I will make time to talk with you. And you know, part of the reason that I would want to make time to talk with you, and if you run across a wise person, one of the reasons why you would want to make time to talk with them is because you will gain, I will gain instruction from them. I will gain wisdom from their perspective. Is this coming from a godly source? Whether highly educated, sort of educated, not educated at all, doesn't matter. The spirit of the living God is at work in that situation, and you will learn, and you will grow, and you will, just like it says there, increase in learning. That's the guidance that we're given. There's an example of this very thing occurring in our Bibles, and this is why I had you turn to Acts chapter 15. A lot of verses in an incident here. When the church first started out, all of Jesus' disciples and all of the apostles that he named were all Jewish background. They were all Jews. All of them Galilean except for Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. When the first church starts... 3,000 were added to their number that day on the day of Pentecost, all Jews. We get an indication that there was a convert to Judaism in the church in Acts chapter 6 when the helpers for the apostles were named, the seven were named. But still, Jewish background, Jewish practice, Jewish customs. By the time we get to Acts chapter 15... Peter's had his visions. He's gone to Cornelius. Samaritans have already been added to the church. Now Gentiles are added to the church. And this incident takes place in the first what looks like majority Gentile church in Antioch of Syria. And if you take a look there in chapter 15, verse 1, 
what we see is some men came down from Judea, and that's where Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church is, the Jewish majority church is. They came down and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. They were teaching uh, circumcision points at the Abrahamic covenant, and of course the law, the teachings of Moses, the Mosaic covenant, is the Old Testament law. And they were saying, in order for you Gentiles to actually be saved... First, you're going to need to convert to Judaism and accept all the tenets of the law. You've got to become Jewish first, then you can become Christian and really be saved. This did not set well with Paul and Barnabas. <laughs> As you take a look there, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them, so <clears throat> that turned out really well. Sharp dispute and, deba and debate. There was, there was dissension, contention. There was, uh, <clears throat> shall we say, uh, that uh, there was uh, maybe some elevated emotional levels here, <clears throat> and that became, that was a huge issue. You had the issue of, First, you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian and then really get saved. And then you have the issue of dissension, dispute, debate. That kind of debate, that kind of word going on. Well, there was not going to be any resolution there. So, Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this uh, question. The church sends them on their way, and uh, down through uh, verse 5, you see them arriving uh, at, uh, at Jerusalem, and you have the two parties that are there in the midst of this debate over whether or not you have to become a Jew first. At Jerusalem, the tenor of what was going on changes and here's the process that they went through now look who it is that's chiefly involved here and takes over the situation right at the start of verse 6 the apostles and elders met to consider this question boom now it's no surprise <clears throat> that you have apostles involved uh, is it you know, the apostles most of them still have their ministry centered at the Jerusalem church and in Judea at this point in time. But all of a sudden, popping up here in the function of the Jerusalem church is the elders. And what happens? Notice back up in verse 2, we have dispute or some translations are dissension, debate. <laughs> we have real adversity, words that describe a real adversity. But here in verse 7, all of a sudden you, say, you see the word after much discussion. It's gone from dissension, <clears throat> dispute, debate to discussion. And if you're having a discussion, is everybody speaking at the same time? Is nobody listening to each other? Or are they listening? You see what's going on here? We've got a group that's starting to listen, to gather information. And you see right there in verse 7, Peter, he gets up and he um, gives an eyewitness account from uh, the middle of verse 7 to the start of verse 11 about what had happened amongst the Gentiles in his ministry. Then Paul and Barnabas give an eyewitness account of what 
uh, they had been doing. And do you notice in those verses that it says that everyone listened and fell silent when Peter started giving his eyewitness account and that they are still listening through the account of Paul and Barnabas. Quick to listen. And so they continued in this discussion they are considering. It's not dissension and debate. It's consideration and debate. And also notice that you don't see people giving quips, clever twists of the tongue, zingers trying to win a point by being argumentative. They're focused on gathering information, listening, being quick to listen. After all of this occurs, then guess who pops up? <clears throat> Verse 13. When they finished, James spoke up. This is not James the Apostle, son of Zebedee. It's not James the Apostle, son of Alphaeus. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. Same guy. And he says, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophet are in agreement, and he goes on down through summarizing the consideration, the discussion that had taken place, having listened for quite a lengthy amount of time. Because you remember, Peter's telling everything that he had seen. Paul and Barnabas are witnessing to everything they had seen, and Paul and Barnabas have already been through the first missionary journey. That's a lot of events. But they listened. Only after a lengthy and, and thorough consideration of the issue did James as the lead elder and the same man that God used to write the book of James bring the discussion to a conclusion. And as you look on down uh, through what he uh, what he decided through down through verse 21, you see that he makes accommodations for all of the sides in question, but he's faithful to God's intent and purpose in this. And then the whole church falls into one accord. From verses 22 to 35, you have them decide who's going to go, send the message, they write a letter. And send them off. Everyone was in one accord in Jerusalem. Everyone in Antioch was in one accord. All of the Jewish background believers are in one accord. All of the Gentile background believers are in one accord. Because they have followed this pattern that James writes about in his epistle in James 1. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, and this produces the righteous life that God desires. Do you realize what happens here? Because they do it God's way, you and I, my Gentile brothers and sisters, did not have to convert to Judaism first in order to be saved. That's an effect that we see and benefit from to this very day. Christianity is not a sect of Judaism. It is its own entity. It has its own doctrine. It has its own practice. It has its own teaching. And it flows out of these principles being applied, 
by Jewish background believers. Do you catch that? Oh, my. Can God do what he intends or not? <laughs> yes. And that brings about the righteous life that God desires. And of all people to be involved on both ends of this, you have James, the half-brother of the Lord. Can you imagine having Jesus as your older brother and you do something and your dad, Joseph, says, I and then your mom, Mary, pipes up and says, why can't you be more like Jesus? James and his brothers <laughs> and, uh, and his sisters were not on board with what Jesus was doing during his earthly ministry, if you remember. They were trying to get him to come on out of there, you know, let's just, let's, let's just, let's just, just kind of calm that down, you know, because things are starting to stir up and, and let's just slide away quietly. Now... James, having listened, has learned the lesson, and he's fully on board, and he's given that same lesson to us. And the result is they're all in one accord. Well, now, my brothers and sisters, oh, forgot to punch up the one that says the result. So what are we going to do? We have some opportunities coming. And back to what James said. This is also NIV. Look at this carefully. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. I'm going to stop right there at verse 22. It's very easy for us to take a look at the information that's available around us, including reading our Bible, including going to prayer, including to talking to others, and to decide that, well, everything that I was thinking and everything that I wanted is all confirmed by what I'm seeing here. What that usually means is, is we've missed something because nobody, no human, ever gets it 100% right. And we only look as far as we want to go. We only listen in reality to that which we really just want to hear so that we can confirm what we knew all along. And if we end up just keeping doing what we were doing and we find ourselves in the midst of dissension and dispute kind of debates, something's wrong there and we need to go back and re-examine how we got to that point and then come to this. A point of surrender in our lives where we not merely listen to the word and deceive ourselves, but rather we move on to do what it says. The rubber has to meet the road. The actions have to take over and result in a demonstration of the righteous life that God desires. Not the righteous life that I desire, to get what I want when I want it. But the righteous life that God desires that gets what he wants 
when he wants it. And the deceiver is always there to help out with that line and so deceive yourselves. If we deceive ourselves and save him the effort, he's happy about that. He'll just let us go. But he's always at work. And we always have to be watching. We always have to be on our toes because he is very happy to come in and, and give us those little nudges that make us feel like what I want and what I'm thinking and what I'm doing is good and right to justify ourselves and we end up in the, in the wrong place. Anything that's going on that ends up with dispute, dissension, with anger, we're not doing what the Lord says. And remember, he did have something to say about that. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. Yes, the word do is in there and command is in there. And he saw to it that his half-brother was inspired to write the book of James and to include this pattern. Remember the principle. One, quick to listen. Two, slow to speak. Three, slow to become angry. Now repeat those with me. One, quick to listen, two, slow to speak, and three, slow to become angry. One more time, let's double the number of voices. One, quick to listen, two, slow to speak, and three, slow to become angry. Excellent. Excellent. Now, guess what? We have some opportunities coming up very soon. And yeah, the, the print's a lot smaller. I, I, I ran out of space. I even say that at the bottom. <laughs> Got a business meeting next Sunday. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Deacons, whether it's in a meeting or you're doing whatever, same thing. How about the church council? Some of you serve on that. There's another opportunity. The succession team. The school board. Ministries that are in our directorates. Our equip classes. Awana. Youth activities. And add your own here, because I ran out of space. And you got a spot there in the, in the bulletin to write down, if you're part of any of these, write that, write, I, I have an opportunity to be one, quick to hear, uh, quick to listen. I get, I, I get muddled up in my translation sometime. One, quick to listen. Two, slow to speak. Three, slow to become angry. And not only in things directly connected with the activities of Northern Hills Baptist Church. What about things that involve the rest of your family that might not come here? What about things you're involved with, especially that include non-believers? What about that? If we want people, 
in our witness of the gospel to show them something that is attractive. And we're quick to anger. Do you think that's a good witness? If we're piping up before we have complete information and shooting our mouths off, does that show the righteous life that God desires? Is that an effective witness? If we're not careful with our words, if we don't take the time to be quick to listen to non-believers, listen to their perspective, listen to their wants, wishes, and desires. Find the places, they'll tell you the places in their hearts and souls that are empty and that long for the living God. But if we don't listen to them, we'll never know. Brothers and sisters, we're here to be this kind of witness and to witness to the righteous life that God desires. We're here to show that we are his friends by doing what he commands. And we are here to spread that gospel message to all those non-believers. If there's anyone in here today that has not yet confessed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you will see that we are maturing. We're not perfect, and we never will be, but we're getting a little bit better at listening, a little bit better at holding our tongues until we have listened so that will be a little bit better at holding back on that anger that comes out when we shoot our mouth off without complete information. And you'll say, and they'll say, wow. That's something that I'm missing. That's attractive to me. I want to know more about that. And then you find them turning from being the scoffer or the mocker into being the wise. They may be ignorant about the Lord, but they can be taught and we can show them the way to salvation. <laughs> we can show them the way to eternal life and give them the hope that you and I, my brothers and sisters, enjoy because we know that in spite of all our muddling around as it happens sometimes, the Lord has drawn us into his family and we are headed toward an eternity with him. In any of these circumstances, when you get into them, I want you to run this through your mind and say it with me. One, be quick to listen. Two, slow to speak. And three, slow to become angry. More voices this time. One, quick to listen. Two, slow to speak. And three, slow to become angry. And then we will enjoy the blessings that God showers upon us for bringing about the righteous life that he desires. As Amy and Kevin come up, I invite you, brothers and sisters, if there have been any circumstances in which you need to come and say, well, Lord, I, I, was, I was not quick to listen. I was too quick to speak, and I was quick to anger. And come and and pray and confess before the Lord, I invite you to do so. And I invite those who have never taken Jesus as your Savior to come this day and receive that newness of life that comes that will help you become quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Would you, would you stand? Would you stand, please? the deer panted for the water so my soul
aquí. And so may it be, O oh Lord, that your spirit would fill us and that as we speak with one another here, as we go from this place, that we will be quick to hear, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry so that you may find within us growing the righteous life that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen.